It's been a month since Operation Alexa flood and Palestine and the world will never be the same again. One month since the war on Gaza began, what are its implications? Hundreds of thousands of workers in Quebec and Canada walked out of their jobs on Monday in the first leg of a protest action. What are they demanding? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day and before we go any further, if you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, please do. Today is November 7th and it's been one month since Operation Alexa flood launched by the Palestinian resistance groups and one month since Israel's brutal war on Gaza began. It's safe to say that the region will never be the same again. The past month has been many things. It has torn the facade of Israel's claim to superiority and democracy, exposed the hollowness of every pious word spoken by the United States. And above all, these 31 days have been a testimony to the resilience and resistance of the people of Palestine. This one month has also shown that regardless of what governments across the world say, the streets stand with Palestine. We go to Abdul for the analysis of the past month. Abdul, it's been one month since what is called Operation Alexa flood and I think it's safe to say that uh, you know, much has changed in the world. It's no longer the region will never be the same again. Dramatic changes which I think will, the impact will resonate for decades, I, I think. So maybe one month down the line could you sort of Take us through what you analyze as the overall situation in Palestine as far as, uh, you know, as, far as uh, the developments are concerned. There are uh, different ways one can look at what happened in last one month and how it has impacted the overall situation, uh, both as well in relation to the Palestinian question and also in relation to the global politics. Uh, when we talk about the Palestinian question, of course, uh, the war, apart from bringing destruction to the Palestinians in Gaza or kind of a, kind of a, 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 another set, what Palestinians call the Nakba, uh, that uh, forced displacement of people as if Israel is hell-bent to kind of remove a large number of Palestinians from the a part of Gaza in order to, to, in fact, today Netanyahu said that he uh, he wants to uh, maintain the control over Gaza for uh, uh, for few, uh, he did not say period, for indefinite period after the war. It means that there, there is an, uh, uh, the, the Palestinians, as far as the Palestinians is Gaza, in Gaza is concerned, of course, they are facing renewed attack and there is uh, forced displacement and so on and so forth destruction uh, hu hu the, the humanitarian situation has gone bad to worse all those are on one point the material losses and the loss of the people uh, life apart from that when we analyze it in the political context we also see that this this uh, war has also kind of brought the issue of Palestine back into the global politics. Uh, the kind of popular support the Palestinian uh, issue has got all across the world, uh, uh, the kind of mobilization we have seen is, is very much unprecedented in the sense that after 2003, this is the largest popular mobilization on the streets all across the world. And, uh, and this shows uh, that uh, at least... Uh, you can say the unintended consequences from the Israeli perspective is the question of Palestine is no more uh, a kind of a secondary subject to be discussed and uh, people are trying to put it on the main course. So that is one uh, when it comes to the Palestinian issue. Uh, 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 as uh, In terms of the global politics, of course, uh, uh, this has exposed the, uh, the war in Palestine, the war in Gaza has exposed the, the imperialist project which uh, uh, Israel is and how uh, uh, kind of uh, the hypocritic, the global politics pursued by the superpowers like US has been, how that, uh, the, the talks of human rights is empty, how they have been kind of uh, reluctant to even implement the basic principles uh, which they claim to champion on where when it comes to Palestine, uh, people of Palestine, the children of Palestine dying, in, in, in hundreds every uh, uh, few hours. So, uh, so yes, uh, of course, there are uh, there is a negative side. Uh, the number of people have died. Uh, the number of children in Palestine have died. It has created an unprecedented humanitarian situation on the ground. But also, it has kind of uh, uh, kind of re-energized the anti-imperialist 
feelings uh, uh, in the large uh, part of the world and kind of also brought the issue of Palestine back into the focus. Uh, so these are uh, two ways of looking at uh, how the war uh, in Palestine, this war in Palestine has impacted the global politics in last one month. Well, it's an interesting point that you mentioned because I think, uh, like we talked about in earlier episodes, this uh, this uh, the nature of Israel's brutal attack has thrown into sharp focus. You know, where whereas earlier people could restrict themselves to statements or even in some cases pretend not to see or make very ambivalent statements, now that is becoming increasingly untenable. And even for the United States, in fact, for all their attempts. But let's maybe take a look at some more detail at the US approach itself because that has been very central uh, to this whole question. And uh, I think it's been quite revealing to see the extent to which the United States has been uh, you know, it has always backed Israel for decades, of course, but the extent to which the United States is playing, you know, a very uh, unfortunate brand of politics. We know, for instance, that they even they voted against the mention of a humanitarian ceasefire and insisted on, you know, changing the language. So, how do you see uh, U.S. politics, uh, you know, its role in the region right now? Well, uh, I'll... As I said before, this has basically exposed uh, the U.S. policies in the region like never before. Of course, we have seen that in last few years, there has been greater realization that uh, about Israel, uh, sorry, about U.S. policies. The 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 kind of you can say the emptiness or the uh, rhetoric of the U.S. policy being so uh, empty of substance that uh, on one side it talks about democracy, human rights, and uh, kind of uh, rights of the people uh, in uh, in different parts of the world. For example, in Ukraine, but uh, when it comes to uh, kind of taking any uh, stand in support of uh, a kind of freedom of people, which uh, everyone knows how Palestinians have been occupied. And this is, you can say in one way, is the last surviving colony of the old type. Uh, despite it's being well known, US has kind of refused to acknowledge that fact and has tried to play a role of kind of mediator between the two conflicting parties. This idea of two conflicting parties kind of putting Palestinians uh, uh, as an equal to Israel as if the, uh, one is not occupied and one is not the occupier. That basically was not very uh, clear all these years uh, uh, to a large part of large generation, particularly which uh, was born, you can say post 1990s, post 2000. And that basically has kind of been exposed uh, like never before. Uh, if you see how they kind of vetoed, uh, the, as you rightly pointed out, in the United Nations Security Council, a resolution which basically talks about uh, humanitarian uh, ceasefire, uh, how they basically have deployed armaments and uh, increased their presence, military presence in the region, just to kind of protect Israel's uh, war in Gaza. Uh, 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 and how they are basically trying to uh, kind of, in a way, run Israeli foreign policy for, uh, uh, while uh, uh, Blinken and Biden visiting the region repeatedly, trying to persuade Arab countries not to do anything, not to kind of issue statements which are considered to be, quote unquote, harmful to what Israel is doing. Uh, all of this basically in a way, reaffirms the the long standing and uh, long uh, held understanding of a section of the people that U.S. is basically an imperialist project. Uh, sorry, Israel is basically an imperialist project in the region, and U.S. is the real puppet master. And and, and this, uh, I, as I said, for a generation, this was not the uh, thing to be a uh, uh, thing to kind of uh, accept. Now. Uh, because of the things happening, the way it is unfolding, despite the media gag and everything, this is reaching to a large part of people and they are increasingly realizing how this is the case. And uh, in a way, of course, we don't know what will happen in the future, but in a way, it is basically a kind of a move forward for the uh, 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 much more just uh, uh, international politics in a way. Right. That's a good point, Abdul, because I think, like you were saying, there's there, there's been maybe a normalization of the violence against Palestinians that has been taking place because 
One, the intensity and regularity with which Israel has been conducting it over the years. We've seen repeated attacks on Gaza. We've seen the kind of, you know, offensives that are taking place in West Bank, East Jerusalem and all that. And whereas, you know, now many of those, uh, many, it has been thrown even starker. But one interesting thing you mentioned is also about the region itself. And we know that Prior to this, there was this process of normalization which was going on, which really the US had invested in massively. And even some countries in the region at various levels were interested. The big question at that time was whether Saudi Arabia would at that point. And there was also a different dynamic where within the region itself, countries were sort of trying to work out their differences like between Iran and Saudi Arabia, etc. So how do you see this last month and the kind of impact it has had on all these processes? Well, I think the so-called Abraham Accords are dead uh, by and large for one reason. Of course, nobody is, is saying that there will be no normalization with Israel in future. But uh, the way U.S. has tried to push it, uh, 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 kind of completely neglecting the Palestinian cause. And uh, it, it seemed for a while that a, a section of the Arab countries are very much willing to kind of accept that kind of uh, uh, approach is no more uh, uh, viable uh, now uh, and because not only because uh, uh, the the number of people killed or the kind of atrocities and the occupation has been exposed to the ruling classes no it is because the the arab population also uh, have uh, kind of uh, have, uh, has become much more assertive uh, in a way that they are no longer willing to accept whatever comes from their uh, governments in a way they were ready to do it before because it for a very long time it was it seemed as we discussed earlier that the issue of palestine is now almost like a very minor issue related to a, a, a small part of the world which has nothing to do with the rest of the arab countries now the way it has unfolded the way it, uh, it has required despite us attempts not to uh, uh, take regional uh, 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 regional dimensions. It has taken regional dimension in a way that, as I said before, that Anthony Blinken had to visit the region three times uh, within a month to kind of persuade countries not to do it. And so despite all those attempts, it has acquired a regional uh, uh, a dimension. And the people uh, in these uh, countries are of course, it, it, uh, will not accept the, the kind of narrative which was weaved all this while that Palestine is not an issue for them. It is now uh, uh, much more uh, uh, accepted that Palestine is an Arab issue. Palestine is a uh, global issue. It is an is issue related to justice uh, uh, for the Palestinians. That, that is one. Uh, uh, the, the, the one, mes uh, one small point uh, uh, should also be... Uh, uh, made about the uh, the kind of uh, uh, image Israelis were trying to portray uh, all this while uh, in among the Arab countries that they are uh, economically and technologically uh, 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 superior. Uh, uh, Israel is a superior country, and Arab countries will benefit if they kind of align with uh, uh, Israel in one way or another. And, and and there is no benefit uh, they are gaining if they are kind of in the name of Palestine, they are kind of keeping away from Israel. So it is more harmful to keep away from Israel and it is beneficial uh, to kind of be aligned with Israel. This uh, notion has also been questioned in last one month the, because uh, the kind uh, small Palestinian resistance movement has been able to inflict a kind of... Uh, 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 kind of uh, attack on Israel, which basically questions its so-called te technological superiority or the superiority in weapon production and so, and so forth. It has to depend, it is very clear, on the sub U uh, weapons supplied by the U.S., diplomatic support sub uh, supplied by the U.S., money uh, given by the U.S. Uh, uh, around $4.5 uh, billion in aid. Um, uh, so all this basically exposes the invincibility of Israeli model in the region, and that also will have an impact on the future uh, diplomatic uh, attempts to kind of make Israel much more acceptable in the region until uh, there, is a, uh, there is an independent Palestinian state. Right, Abdul, thank you so much for that analysis. So many issues, like you said, you know, the question, uh, among other things, for instance, the whole 
question of the two state solution being dead has again once again become clear so much more clearer right right now after all these developments as well we also know that in the northern border uh, hezbollah has also taken a very powerful stand which you know which, which will only increase uh, you know the problems israel is facing and not to mention uh, i think benjamin netanyahu being more exposed than ever before in his political career so much to uh, you know talk about as well but thank you so much for that analysis and we'll be coming back to you for regular updates on gaza on the resistance to israeli occupation and apartheid around 400000 workers in quebec and canada are gearing up for one of the largest public sector strikes in decades in the run up workers across sectors walked out of their jobs on monday and are set for a major round of protest actions in the third week of november now the demands of those being made by workers across the world pay hikes that deal with inflation decent working conditions in short respect for their labor but the government seems unwilling to acknowledge these concerns if you go by the offers that they're making anish joins us for more anish thank you so much for joining us quite a massive strike by uh, you know start protest action by workers in across sectors in quebec actually and uh, you know also sort of testimony to the kind of rising Uh, aggressiveness assertiveness of labor movements in that region as well so could you maybe first take us through exactly what kind of workers are protesting what are the kind of demands that they've been they've been putting forward and why are they making these demands so uh, right now what we're looking at is about uh, four major sectors uh, pretty much related to education healthcare and social services uh we are uh, witnessing a whole host host of strikes by different uh classes of workers uh, what we can look at is uh is that it is not an entirely total uh strike uh that that is shutting down the entire sector uh, but uh, a certain kind of targeted strike uh that uh, where you have public sector workers and essential services uh, uh you know being running but other than that uh you have a whole host of other workers uh walking out and that's about uh, just 400000 uh, more than four, uh, around 420000 workers and that's a massive uh turnout for us uh, you know a state wide strike uh, in many ways uh, and that uh, that is actually uh, one of the highlights and we can actually expect more uh strikes in coming days uh, on the 21st there is going to be another three uh, three day strike and there are probably going to be other uh, strikes that are happening outside of this uh, you know the this coalition of uh, you know trade unions of four major trade unions that are working uh, in hand together and these trade unions are pretty much uh, are the ones who are right now negotiating with the government for a wage hike uh, and in this uh, the strike in itself is a result of the fact that the kind of offer that the government has given is not satisfactory uh, they had given a 10% a 10.3 something percent of uh, wage hike over the next 5 years and that is not even uh, you know forget about accommodating inflation rates it's not it's barely uh, you know a 2% or a 2 and a half percent rate hike uh, over the next 5 years and that is really not uh, you know in keeping with any kind of precedent even uh be it in Canada or Quebec and this uh is something that is uh, being strongly opposed uh, obviously they are they are having to deal with a very conservative uh, fiscally conservative government that does not believe that uh you know wage hikes are necessary for workers to uh thrive or survive even even in the current situation and despite the fact that Canada unlike you know other western nations or even its neighbor the united states uh, hasn't done that badly when it comes to the cost of living crisis uh, it has you know managed decently well but that doesn't mean that the effects were not felt uh, on the working classes and we have also seen uh, like many other places real wages coming down dramatically over the past few years and so what the workers are looking for is a uh, is an inflation not just an inflation adjusted uh, wage hike but an inflation based wage hike for over the next several years and they have made that very clear but the government pretends that there are there's no concrete um uh you know proposal from on the on the part of the trade unions which is also not true we have we have actually seen very clear set of demands it's just that they obviously haven't come up with an entire tentative deal and that's the only thing that the government is uh, has against uh, the trade unions as of now uh we can actually we are also seeing uh you know a set of uh, strikes uh, by teachers and nurses 
uh, in this year, week alone. And uh, thousands, tens of thousands of uh, public sector workers in these sectors will be actually uh, walking out of their jobs. And that will also be, uh, you know, that will be happening aside from uh, these four major trade unions uh, calling for a national strike. So that is uh, pretty much the scenario that we're looking at. We're looking at a generalized labor militancy of public sector workers, which obviously is coming from uh, you know, a significant level of uh, victories that uh, workers in North America have seen. Uh, and, very, uh, you know, uh, the least of all, uh, which uh, we saw with the trade uh, with the trade unions in automotive sector in the U.S., uh, gaining major hikes, especially bringing back cost of uh, cost of living adjustments. Uh, this is definitely something that has boosted workers morale and the resolve to fight for fair wages and fair contracts in the coming years. Well, Anish, I actually wanted to sort of ask uh, ask you some more a bit about the point, last point you were mentioning, which is that there has been a general, uh, you know, increase in assertiveness in, uh, you know, the stress, uh, in terms of strengthening of trade union movements as well. So how do you see this happening in Canada as a whole as well? Uh, in part, like there are certain social contexts that are different in the case of Canada and the US as well, or at least in the case of Quebec, very specifically. Uh, but you do see certain kind of, uh, you know, overlapping of, uh, you know, social struggle and a working class struggle happening uh, on uh, the same plane, actually. Uh, right now, the public sector workers that we're looking at are majority women. And that definitely is a major aspect on how and the necessity of this uh, workers mobilization happening, because obviously women, uh, much like many other places, uh, are underpaid when compared to their male counterparts. And obviously, uh, there, this mobilization is also highlighting that aspect of it, the fact that the, these public sector workers, especially in, you know, as teachers, as nurses, as uh, auxiliary healthcare workers, as social service workers are, you know, a majority of them, an overwhelming majority of them being women, uh, they do uh, have to be, uh, you know, uh, given a certain kind of uh, consideration on that level as well. So you are also seeing a certain kind of gendered uh, class struggle in many ways, uh, in the way that they are uh, pushing for better wages and better a fair contract, uh, along with the fact that there is a growing movement to actually address uh, gender inequality in these sectors as well. So that uh, that apart from that, we uh, as I said, the victories of uh, working class movements, uh, not just uh, in you know say uh, what we saw with Ford, General Motors, and you know all the uh, automot uh, automobile sector workers have making major gains. Very recently, we have also seen uh, strides uh, being made in uh, new forms of trade unionization uh, in sectors that never really saw unionization before. And that is that has also rubbed off uh, into Canada at this point, and this is pretty much an outcome of uh, those victories uh, and obviously the growing movement to bring out uh, you know work working class uh, needs and you know working class uh, demands to the forefront and to you know to the national conversation, which. Uh, we have to point out, like, was more or less absent in the pre-pandemic era. Uh, even though there were mobilizations, uh, the the impact that they had and the capacity to mobilize was severely restricted for various historical reasons. But right now, they are overcoming all of that to actually make sure that there is, you know, class mobilization happening that, you know, that hasn't happened for decades uh, in, in the continent, actually. And so this is part of that, an extension of that, and probably we will be seeing more, as I said, there are more mobilizations outside of this uh, set of strikes in Quebec alone, and similarly in different parts of Canada. So we will be seeing more such uh, trade union, militant trade union mobilizations in the coming days in Canada for sure. Well, Anish, thank you so much for that update. We'll come back to you when some of those mobilizations you were talking about take place. And that's all we have time for in this episode of Daily Debrief. Do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, watch our videos. And before you go any further, if you haven't hit that subscribe button on YouTube, please do.